Howdy, folks. So, yes, you've read the title right. Uh, computer stuff on my channel again. I know, it's amazing. Uh, so I've recently come across this dead motherboard, and I thought it would be interesting to try and repair it and get it working again. So this is an Asus P8B-X uh, low-end server motherboard. Um, this has a socket um, LGA1155, um, and it's got a Xeon in it, and uh, the motherboard is dead. Uh, the CPU is fine, the motherboard is dead, um, and... I, uh, I want to go through uh, some troubleshooting and see if we can fix this. Um, there's a bit of uh, a background to this. So this uh, was actually a server at my company. Um, I used it for many years, and all of a sudden one day uh, the machine just disappeared from the network, and I went into the server room, hooked up a monitor to it. The PC was on, um, and it had completely just uh, frozen in place. Um, there was no kernel panic, so that's the like the Linux equivalent of a blue screen, essentially. Um, so it, it didn't it didn't it didn't do that. It it didn't crash. Um, it it was still sitting at the login screen, just totally frozen, but it was powered on. So I turned it off, turned it back on again, and the system never came back up. The, the motherboard would no longer post. Um, it would turn on the fans would spin, and that was it. And I did some basic troubleshooting, which I'm going to go over uh, shortly. And uh, ultimately, we determined the motherboard to be the dead component. And I gave the hardware, uh, the whole system, back to our, our company's IT for them to deal with. And we ended up replacing it with a, uh, an AMD Ryzen system. Um, just, you know, very quick, go to a local computer store, buy some parts. I, we, it, we ended up actually upgrading the system, even though it was very inexpensive Ryzen stuff. It was uh, actually significantly better than this hardware. And that's what we actually are currently using. And so... A couple months later, I found uh, this, exactly as you see it here, in my company's e-waste. So the motherboard and the CPU are together, um, with the word dead written on it, as I expect. Um, IT has pillaged the memory and even the CMOS battery and everything. Um, there's no cooler, um, so I'm going to have to find all that stuff. But, uh, yeah, this, this, this board is, is not, uh, not really special. Um, it looks about what you'd expect for a, a server board. Um, it has dual Intel uh, gigabit LAN, you know, serial and uh, VGA, um, you know, USB 2.0 and PS2 ports. Um, there's no USB 3.0 that uh, that's not present here. Um, the VGA is built in to this uh, this horrible, horrible. Um, it, 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 it's almost like a like a BMC, but it's not. Um, it's just a very terrible VGA. Um, so you know, basically, graphics on the output of this are useless. Um, and it's got, you know, it's got some SATA. It has some nice fan headers and stuff. That's at least pretty nice. Um, it has, you know, one internal USB, which could be considered to be kind of nice. Um, it has a TPM header if you want to put a physical TPM board on here, but I think that's kind of useless. Uh, a bunch of serial stuff. Um, nothing really very special. The one thing that's kind of annoying about this board um, is that it uses uh, ECC memory. Um, I say that's annoying. I know that's actually beneficial in a lot of ways, uh, but I actually don't have a whole lot of ECC. I do have some, but not a whole lot. Um, so uh, I don't have as much RAM to pick from from my stash um, to use on this if if I can't get it working. And of course, it has no overclocking capabilities. Uh, there's no heat sinks on the VRMs. Uh, it's a Xeon, so there's no overclocking anyway. Uh, but this is a, a decent uh, Xeon. Let's see if I can get the part number. It's a E3 1240. V2, I believe, so it's a 4-core, 8-thread um, Xeon from, uh, I think, the 2011-ish time, time period. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to uh, hook up some power to this. I got a power supply over here. I'm just going to hook up some power, uh, find a CPU cooler, find some RAM, and I'm just going to turn it on and show you what it does, and we can get troubleshooting. So I've gone through my bins of stuff, and I've come up with a CPU cooler, not a very big one, and it's a stock cooler, but this is good enough for testing. I've got some uh, DDR EC3 memory to put in there, and uh, you'll notice that I put it in the second slot. Um, if you've ever wondered why motherboard manufacturers color the slots this way, um, they do it, one, to tell you which channel is which, but they also do it to tell you which ones you should use for single, uh, single stick operation per channel. And the reason they do this is because the, these, uh, the memory channels are generally wired as a bus, um, so the, what you want is you want the, the memory to be on the very end of the bus, uh, so it acts as, as, a, as a termination. If you put it in the, the slot closer to the CPU, you basically have a bunch of wires hanging off the end, and so the signal from the, the, the CPU will go uh, past the memory module 
to the end of the wire and then bounce back as a reflection, and uh, this can cause uh, stability issues. Um, so that's why they always ask you to put it as far away as possible, um, and that's why they color the slots differently, and it's actually pretty much the only thing that I use motherboard manuals for anymore is figuring this out. But anyway, so this is, this is the correct memory configuration, even though it's in a weird-looking slot. Um, and I found a CMOS battery, and that's about all I need. And you notice that I haven't bothered to put in a keyboard uh, or a monitor, because uh, the last time I saw this board, it was borked, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be borked in the exact same way, so I have very low confidence it's going to do anything at all. Um, so the, the reason why we don't need those is because there's a PC speaker here, and I know this board because I've used it, um, and this board model will beep once when power on self-test is completed, and so um, if the board is working, we should hear a beep. Um, and I can tell you that we're probably not going to. I've also got a kilowatt here um, on the power supply, so I'll just turn the power supply on. There's got a little power LED. Um, so we can see if, if the power is fluctuating, if the board is actually doing anything or not, uh, but I don't think it is. So I'm just going to short this out down here, which is this, uh, this jumper here. Yes, here we go. So you can see it's drawing 30... 37 watts or so, and it's not beeping, and it's not doing anything. The fans are spinning, um, but it's it's not drawing any different amount of power, and this, this board doesn't take very long to post. It's actually a pretty fast-to-post board as far as servers go, which is pretty nice, um, and so it's just going to sit like this forever. And um, so, yeah, it, it's, it's not going to do anything, so I'm just going to cut the power um, because it's kind of boring. So... The, uh, the reason why I'm, I'm making this video uh, is because generally we think of you know, computers as having a bunch of different components, and when they fail, we replace them, right? CPU fails, we replace it. RAM fails, we replace it. Power supply fails, we replace it. Uh, and the same thing with the motherboard, right? It's considered a component, and it gets replaced. But obviously, as you can see, the motherboard is really just a collection of smaller components, and I believe that some of these components that are on boards are user-serviceable if you have... Um, very basic uh, equipment. Um, obviously, a CPU, for example, you can't take it apart and fix it. Um, you know, no, no, nobody is expected to be able to do that. Um, not even the manufacturer could do that. But motherboards are a little different, and they're usually hard to come by, especially um, for for certain like uh, like the LG uh, LG LG uh, 1366 boards, for example. Um, those boards are notoriously um, difficult to come by. Uh, because the boards all have problems now, um, and, you know, finding a perfectly good board is bad. Uh, it's really hard. It's really hard. Uh, so fixing boards, I think, is something that you should definitely try to do um, and try and identify what went wrong. Um, so that's, that's kind of why I'm doing this. And sometimes it can be very, very easy to do. So I have a video on my channel. I think it's this channel. It might be the second one, but it's probably the, the main channel, um, where a while ago I fixed uh, another board. It was an Asus board as well. And it had a broken uh, chassis intrusion circuit. Um, so uh, workstation boards and server boards, um, they support a, a, a header um, where you can connect a, a switch. And that switch goes in the case and it's attached to the door. So it's such that when you open the case door, uh, the motherboard uh, monitors that switch and it knows that the, the case was opened and it can then alert the system administrator on boot up that someone has opened the box. And uh, in this case, this actually has it. It's this, it's this blue jumper here. It's just jumped out. So basically, you know, there's no switch connected, but you could connect one there if you wanted to. And th this other board, it was, um, it was basically always asserted. So you'd power it up. It would say, you know, someone opened the box. You would clear it. It would reboot and then tell you, you know, someone opened the box, even though the jumper was there. So you could actually never boot into an operating system. So the board was effectively useless. And so I tracked it down to a bad transistor on the board. And since I didn't need the circuit, I actually just ripped it off, and the board is still functional to this day. So um, that's kind of what I'm hoping we can do here, is we can uh, quickly and, and easily diagnose what's wrong on this board uh, and fix it. And most of the parts on these boards are, I would consider, serviceable. There's only a few things that are not. Um, obviously, the chipset is one of them. That's a, like a thousand-pin ball grid array, you know, BGA package. That's not something that you're going to be able to source that part or fix that yourself. Um, the socket itself, the socket's damaged, 
you know, beyond a bent pin or something. Again, that's that's something you probably can't deal with. Um, the power controller ICs, they generally have firmware on them, so that's not something you're easily going to be able to find. And uh, yeah, so in this case, the VGA chip here as well could be a problem. However, this this chip actually can be disabled. There's actually a jumper to turn it off. And also, you don't need this. Uh, you could put your own GPU in here as well. So there's only a few parts on here that you couldn't get. Everything else is 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 pretty standard uh, integrated circuits that you could buy off of DigiKey or New Arc, like New Arc or, or uh, uh, Mouser or something like that. So anyway, um, so let's start with the diagnosis. It doesn't work. Um, the first thing that I did, and, and I've, I've done these already. So uh, this was stuff I did originally when this failed. So I'm just going to go over it. Uh, the first thing to do is obviously to to check the memory, so uh, it had four DIMMs in it, so you take out all but one DIMM and you try it again, that made no change, then you swap out that one DIMM just to verify that you know you don't have problems in the lower the, like the lower 64k of RAM which will stop it from posting, so that's one thing to check, that made no difference, then you can clear the CMOS, so there's a jumper for that, that made no difference, um, then I removed the battery completely, so just you know a complete hard reset of everything, you know, take the battery out, wait a minute, and then put it back in and try it again, um, that made no difference. I checked the battery voltage. That was fine. Um, so that's pretty much all you really can do um, at this point. Uh, now, there's one tip that I have, um, which is to determine kind of where in the post the failure is occurring. So this board, um, unlike some of the, the newer high-end boards, does not have a postcode readout. So anyone who's familiar with the, the overclocking series boards and the, uh, the the higher just the higher end boards in general, they'll have a seven segment display on them, uh, which gives you a bunch of hexadecimal numbers as it's going through its power on self test. And the the display usually converts to like CPU temperature once the board's booted, and that that is there to tell you where in the power on self test uh, the board currently is. So if it gets stuck and hangs. Um, you can look at that number and look at the manual and you can find out what it was trying to do when it failed and that will help you diagnose what's wrong. So of course in overclocking that's important because you're going to be you're going to be you know intentionally having problems and so you want to know you know what what part of my overclock is causing instability. Um, but in, in in this case it would also help us to figure out you know it, it's clearly it's starting up at least it's turning on so it's doing something but it's not getting very far. Um, so even cheaper boards now have some LEDs on them to tell you, you know, what's happening. This board has nothing. Now, you can get postcode readout cards that work in PCI um, that have those displays on them, uh, but they only work in PCI, uh, not PCI Express. And so most new boards, of course, don't have PCI, so that's not going to help us. I don't have one of those, so unfortunately we don't have that. Um, but in general, and this is a, a just a, a very, very general rule, but most BIOSes generally will initialize the CPU first, then the memory, and then the graphics in that order. Um, and so one trick that I have is to actually just take out the memory completely. Now, you would expect that when you have no memory, uh, you expect the, the device to beep, um, giving you like a, a memory error uh, beep code. And if you get that, then that means the BIOS got far enough in post to try to initialize the memory. And if you don't get it, then that means it didn't get far enough to initialize memory and you have a problem very early on in the power on self test. So I'm actually going to do that right now. And uh, with no memory, we should get a beep code, which we don't get. So it's doing the same thing as before, 37 watts, nothing is happening. So this tells me that it's failing very early. Um, too early to use memory, because normally the BIOS will start by actually using the cache in the CPU uh, as rudimentary memory. It, it puts its stack there, and that's how it can start executing without memory being available. That's how it can actually generate the beep code uh, without having any memory. That's, that's how it does it, and it switches to memory um, after that. So this tells me that there is some pretty serious problem going on. So um, we're off to next. So the next logical thing to do is to disable things that are unnecessary. Um, so in this case, this board uh, has the ability to disable the graphics, to disable the, uh, the two onboard LANs with jumpers. Um, it has the ability to turn off Intel Management Engine and a bunch of other jumpers. Um, that's specific to this board. Your board probably won't have that. Um, and it's honestly, it's, it's especially given a problem this early, these, these pieces of hardware aren't going to be uh, initialized that early. Uh, 
but it's worth a shot to do that if you have the ability. Now, I've already done that off camera and it makes no difference, so I'm not going to bore you um, watching it do nothing. Um, but I would try that if you can, because taking as many things out of the equation is, of course, you know, the first thing to do. Uh, but the next thing we're actually going to do is, which is why I've got my multimeter here, uh, is we're going to measure some voltages, because if there is a missing or incorrect power rail on this board, that could cause um, the thing to just not work, uh, because it, it could be that the, the PCH, for example, is not getting all of its voltage rails, or maybe the CPU isn't getting all of its voltage rails. Um, you may have seen that if you forget the, uh, the, like the ATX 12 volt um, supplementary power connector for the CPU, uh, your motherboard will sometimes do this exact same thing, where it will just turn on and do nothing, because the CPU isn't getting the power it needs. Um, and you can check that. So uh, what we're going to do is verify all the power rails on this board. And now, obviously, you're not going to get a schematic for this, uh, and you don't really need one. Um, the easiest way to, to look for, for basically power supplies um, is to look for, for inductors. Because inductors signify, you know, a voltage is either being boosted up or bucked down. And so you can tell that there's some power supply stuff here, there's some power supply stuff here. Um, and also, you know, big power packages that are, you know, the D-packs that are, um, you know, uh, heat sunk into the board with capacitors next to them. Obviously, this is the VRM, that's pretty obvious. So you can, you can see where the power stuff is. And uh, what I like to do is on these, on these uh, D-pack transistors, um, you know, the tab, the metal tab, which is, you know, what heat sinks into the board, that's usually connected um, to, the, uh, to the source um, or, or the drain, depending on the, the part. But it's connected usually to one of the pins, and so you can quickly just probe around and see if you can find some, some voltages. So um, for a ground, uh, because I am going to be doing this with a camera and one-handed, I'm just going to shove this into uh, a connector, um, like, a, like a lug here, because those are usually connected for... for um, or like RF reasons, they're usually connected to ground, and uh, we don't really care too much about, uh, you know, probing this, you know, correctly. We're just going to try and get some rough values to see if uh, voltages are present. So obviously you want to check your power supply and make sure that your power supply is right. Sorry for the glare, but the lighting's not that great. Obviously check the power supply is not, like, broken, but um, I know this power supply is fine. Even though it's an OCZ, um, you know, probably the only OCZ power supply still in existence, because like 30% of the stuff they made was defective out of the box, including the first power supply from OCZ that I got was DOA, and I had to go stand in the line for a few hours to replace it for this one. So glad they don't exist anymore as a company. Anyway, um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to probe around and see if we can find some voltage rails, uh, and see if we can figure out what they go to. So I'm just probing the, you know, the, the tabs of these transistors. So here, um, you know, we've got 3.3 volts, so we expect to see 3.3 volts on the board somewhere, that's fine. Um, you know, 3.3 volts there. Let's see here. This is, you know, 3.3 volts. Okay, we're getting kind of boring here. Let's check here. Um, 1.473, that could be a 1.5 volt rail. Let's see here. 1.06. So the data sheet for this PCH, which I've already looked at, um, its core voltage is 1.05 volts, and so given the proximity of this regulator to this PCH, I very much expect uh, this 1.06 to be the 1.05 volt core voltage for this, so that means this has its core voltage, that's awesome, um, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, we can take a look at the CPU voltage, which is probably present on here. Uh, let's see, so we've got 1.2 volts, that sounds like a, like a pretty decent core voltage. Um, this is DDR3, so its memory voltage is going to be about 1.5, so I see some stuff up here. Let's poke around. Oh, there we go, 1.5 volts. So that's our DRAM voltage, so we have memory voltage. Um, obviously, we're, we expect to see some 5-volt stuff. There's some 5-volt stuff. And we also expect to see some 12-volt stuff somewhere on this board, uh, because, of course, we're going to... Uh, everything's derived from 12 volts somewhere. Uh, let's see. I don't know where I'm going to find that, but... There we go, there's 12 volts to prove it's present on the board. So... Um, Obviously, I can go through and check all of the, the transistors to see if, if there's anything weird. Really, what, what we're just looking for is just anything that's um, out of the ordinary. Obviously, you don't know uh, that that's exactly supposed to be 3.3, because you don't have a schematic, but 3.3 is a standard rail. You expect to see it on the board, so I, I think that's fine. If you saw something like, I don't know, like 1.9 volts, that's, that doesn't, that's not a standard voltage for anything that I'm aware of. Um, so that could be suspicious. Maybe it's a 3.3 volt rail that's not high enough. Or, or, or maybe it's a, a 1.5 volt rail that's gone too high and blown something up. I don't know. Um, but you just want to check around, or maybe there's no voltage. Um, 
And of course, if you read something and it's like zero, uh, check the other pins. Maybe you're just reading, you know, maybe you're, you're reading the ground connection on that, on that part. Um, but from poking around here, I don't see anything that's immediately obviously wrong as far as power delivery goes, um, which uh, is, is one thing that it's kind of a good sign and kind of a bad sign. Uh, it's a good sign, which means, you know, we don't have anything super obviously um, like that could be blown. Uh, but also, it's kind of sad because power supply stuff is pretty easy to fix. Um, you know, these regulators and, and transistors and stuff, they're really easy to acquire parts, um, and they're really easy to replace. So um, we're going to have to dig a little bit deeper. So the next thing that I want to look at, um, obviously we need power to make everything work, and we also need a clock to make things work. So we need uh, crystal oscillators to get uh, these chips running. So there are a few uh, crystals on this board, um, and they are very likely related to the things they're next to. So this down here, this oscillator package is most likely the clock for this uh, graphics chip down here. Uh, this, this crystal here is very likely the clock for this um, gigabit network card, and there's another one up here for the other gigabit network chip. Um, so these crystals we don't really care about because they power stuff that, they, they drive stuff that we don't care about. Um, the stuff that we really care about uh, are these two crystals down here um, because the PCH is the thing that's actually responsible for kind of turning the computer on. Um, so the BIOS on this board is stored in a SPI flash chip. Um, so SPI is the interface, serial uh, peripheral interface, um, and this is just a small, I think it's like an 8 megabit, um, or sorry, it's an 8 megabyte SPI flash. Um, Sometimes these are in sockets like this one is, and sometimes they're soldered onto the board in in uh, in, in other more like less expensive designs. Um, but when you turn the power on, uh, this chip recognizes you've you've you know, pressed the power button, and it loads the uh, the code from here into you know the PCH, and then it brings up the CPU. And so this this also generates the clocks. So this generates the clock. Uh, this has the PLLs in it that generate the clock for the CPU and a bunch of other stuff. So this thing needs to work, um, and this thing needs its clocks working. So there are two crystals here. Um, this 25 megahertz crystal is what drives um, the vast majority of the logic in here. This is what generates the base clock, which is what you know the CPU is driven off of. Uh, it's, it's got like all the PLLs are driven off of this. This crystal down here is a 32.768 uh, kilohertz watch crystal. So this is for the real time clock. So this is always on. It's powered by this battery when there's no uh, there's no power from the mains applied. And uh, you may think that because this is you know low, this this crystal is just for the clock. It's not needed, but that's actually not true, because if you actually look at the data sheet for this PCH, which is freely available on Intel's website, um, this is used to generate the clock, the spy clock for reading out the data from the BIOS chip. So if this crystal is not running, uh, the, the code won't actually get from the BIOS chip into the PCH, and the system will do nothing. So both of these crystals need to be working. Um, now the easiest way to test if they're working is to get an oscilloscope out and to see if we see 25 megahertz and 32.768 kilohertz on these two crystals. So I'm going to go grab an oscilloscope, and we can go check that. So I went out and got my shitty-ass Siglent scope here, and this is going to allow us to test uh, these two crystals. So the first thing we're going to need to do is turn the board on. So I'll just short out these pins. I should really get a switch on here. Uh, and then we're going to need to ground this. Now, normally when doing RF stuff, you know, you're going to want to make sure signal integrity matters. We don't really care about much about it. So I'm just going to clip this onto the shield of this uh, USB connector here because that's going to be ground and it's going to be good enough ground for the girls I go out with. So. AV reference there for you. Okay, so now we're going to probe uh, these crystals. Now, obviously, we can't. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to move my hand to the other the camera to the other hand because I really can't probe with my left hand. My life depended on it. Um, so, obviously, we can't get to the bottom of the pins on this crystal here uh, because, of course, it's on the other side of the board. And this is a through hole part. It's so I don't really want to go to the other side of the board. That's going to be a pain in the ass. So, on every crystal, there's going to be two load capacitors. Um, that are connected to it. And so these are super tiny, and I don't know if my camera is going to um, really focus, but there are two, two tiny capacitors here with a little resistor in the middle. And so what we're going to see is if, if one side of those capacitors, uh, one side is going to be ground and the other side is going to be on the crystal. So we want the one, of course, 
that has the, the crystal stuff on it. So let's see if we can get a signal here. That doesn't seem right. Sorry, I know this, this is the worst videography ever, but this is what happens when you do stuff with a camera. Yep, okay, so right there we have a signal and uh, it's aliasing a little bit, but you can see the frequency is 24.999 megahertz, so that's our 25 megahertz crystal. And uh, for those who aren't satisfied by that, I will drop the uh, drop the time base so we get a nice waveform. There you go, no more aliasing. Still 25 megahertz. So that tells me that that oscillator is working, or that crystal is working. Um, so I don't believe that that would be our problem. And while we're at it, um, we'll check the other one. Now that's going to be 32 kilohertz, so I'm going to have to change my time base way, way, way the other direction. Um, so that we see it, because it's going to look like DC at that kind of time base. And so here we go, we can see there is some signal on there. We'll change some stuff around a little bit. Let's see what we see. So I see, again, aliasing a little bit. I have to keep taking my hand off the probe here. Worst debugging ever. There we go. So, nice signal, and we see 33 points. Yeah, I don't trust the I don't trust the crystal in this scope, so I bet the crystal on the board is probably more accurate than this. So, anyway, that's our that's our uh, RTC uh, oscillator running. So, both of the crystals are running, which means we have all of the clocks that really matter um, for this board to work. Um, so that is not our issue. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at the BIOS uh, on this board uh, just because it's nice and convenient because it is in a socket so I can just take this chip out and it's a dip package so I can put it in a breadboard and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the contents of this chip out um, and potentially put uh, new contents in it um, so if, if, if the BIOS code uh, is corrupted for any reason um, that could also cause this to hang uh, because you know it's going to be executing the code it's going to crash and then it's just going to stop um, and it's not going to do anything so if it crashes before it, it even gets to output a beep code it's just going to do nothing um, and I have seen BIOSes corrupt before on per perfectly functional boards um, my company had a bunch of ASUS boards it was back with the AMD like Phenom 2 generation um, and they uh, they actually had a notorious problem where they would corrupt in the same way. Um, and we, I identified it was actually the BIOS chips that were the issue, because you could swap these, um, they were in like a PLCC package, um, but you could swap them between boards, and the problems would carry with the BIOS chips. And um, we didn't reprogram them, but uh, it, it showed that, that, I don't know, somehow uh, they, were, they were getting corrupted in such a way that was causing problems. Um, and, and if you did like a BIOS update, you could correct the problem. It was really weird. Um, so I have seen it. It is totally possible. Um, and so that would be the next thing I'd like to take a look at uh, is to just see um, what is on this BIOS chip. So I'm going to grab some pliers, pull this off, and I'm going to set up a Raspberry Pi, which is something that, uh, you know, um, you don't need a fancy chip programmer. You can uh, flash these with a Raspberry Pi. So I'm going to go set that up, and I'll show you uh, how to use it. So this is my um, spy flash flashing apparatus. So this is just an old Raspberry Pi Model B, three, I think third, third generation, I think. It uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, any Raspberry Pi can do this. I'm powering it from a power bank that I got at a thrift store um, because I didn't, this thing didn't like any of my uh, chargers. It said under voltage, so just doing that for now. And I've just got a keyboard connected to it and a little monitor. And the, the actual chip, I've taken it off the motherboard, and you can see it down there in this breadboard. The capacitor is not actually connected. Um, it's from another project. I, I didn't bother to take it off. So I just have some wires going over here. Um, you can find this pinout online. It's, um, there's a bunch of different people that have it. Um, so really what you're, what you're doing is you're disconnecting the spy um, directly over. So um, the, the meso and the mozzie, and then you're connecting the chips select uh, the right pin and then 3.3 volts and ground and you can of course power this chip off 3.3 volts from the regulator that's built into the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's only capable of supplying about 50 milliamps which is totally fine for a chip like this. Um, 
Some people say you can actually try to program the chips in the motherboard. Um, I would not recommend doing this for two reasons. The first one is, as soon as you apply power, um, the 3.3 volt rail, everything on it is going to try and, and, and suck power, um, and the Raspberry Pi will not be able to power that, um, which is going to destroy the regulator on this, um, or be unstable at worst, or, or at best. So just, just I wouldn't bother doing that. And the second reason is, if you try to turn the motherboard on, um, and then just connect this without the power to basically let the motherboard power the chip itself, the problem with that is you don't know if anything else is trying to talk to the chip, and you could end up having uh, programming or, or reading errors because two things are trying to talk on the bus at the same time and you could have big problems. So I find it's better to just take the chip off. If the chip is soldered on, you can easily take it off with a hot air gun. Um, it's, not, it's not hard. Uh, those things are very cheap now. Um, even I have a super cheap hot air station. Um, you know, like you don't need anything fancy, um, and you can get little carrier boards that you can solder it onto, and then it makes it into a dip, uh, so you can then put in a breadboard, uh, or just connect the wires directly. These are just those, uh, I think they're called DuPont wires, where they've got the little connectors on the ends. Um, whatever works, um, that's that's what I do. So I've connected everything up, and uh, the tool we're going to be using is called Flash ROM. It is a uh, an open source uh, tool for doing operations on Spy Flash chips. Um, it's, uh, there's, like I said, there's guides online how to set it up on the Raspberry Pi, which I'm not going to go over um, because a video is not really the best way to uh, describe how to do that. So I'm just going to take you over to a little monitor that I have, and I'm going to show you um, how to dump the contents of the chip because that's the first thing we need to do because uh, we want to make sure, you know, we, we want to have a copy of what's on here before we potentially replace it with anything else. I know I'm doing the cardinal sin of filming a screen, um, and it's a glossy screen at that, um, so I know this is not going to come out well, uh, but pretty much I'm just going to run something that you can find online. I'm just telling, uh, sorry, I'm just telling uh, Flash ROM, basically just uh, use the spy device, um, I'm just using one, one kilohertz spy speed here, and I'm just reading the ROM to just a, a file called old.rom, and it's going to probe the spy bus for a chip. It found uh, this Winbond chip, and it is now reading the flash contents. Um, obviously, the slower spy speeds are going to be more reliable, um, but they're also going to be slower, and so it's going to take about a minute or two to actually read the 8 megabytes on this chip. That sounds very slow, and it is, but then again, uh, the signal integrity with all those wires and a breadboard is not very high, um, and so I'm not running it any faster than this. Now, when you do this, I recommend that you read the file multiple times. Um, so I would say three times is what you should go for. Um, so create three files, you know, like old one, old two, old three. And the reason is that you can then run like a SHA-256 sum on the files to get a checksum for each file. And all three of them should match. If any of them don't match, it means that one of the reads or more of the reads had a an error at some point, And you actually don't know which is the correct one. So basically keep reading until you get a consistent response um, from the chip, so that way you know that's what you have to put back um, if, if the whole BIOS route doesn't work out for you. Um, so if you have consistent problems, put uh, some bypass capacitors on. Um, I'm not actually doing that, I'm just relying on the, the parasitic capacitance of the breadboard, um, which actually uh, in, in most cases works out fine for me, but it may not be fine for your thing. So I'm not going to let you uh, have to wait through this, so I'll, I'll just let you know once it's all done. So after a few minutes, I now have three files, I've just called them old 1, 2, and 3, and you can see I've just run a SHA-256 sum on them, and all three of them are identical. So I have pretty high confidence that these files contain a backup of the data on there. So now I'm free to erase and rewrite this chip, and I can always put the old code back on it. So uh, obviously, the whole point of this is we want to change the code on here. We want to change the BIOS. Um, so uh, we need the BIOS file in order to be able to do this. And you can't just go to the BIOS, uh, you know, like the, the, the manufacturer's website, and download the BIOS uh, update file, because the BIOS update file is very likely uh, contained in a, a, a capsule format. Um, and what we, what we need is not the capsule format, but actually the raw flash contents. Um, now, if you have another motherboard um, of the same model, you can actually read that chip and then put that chip's contents on, you know, your, your dead motherboard. Um, that, that, will, that will work. Um, however, uh, what we're doing is, is not that. Um, I don't have another one of these that I can easily get uh, the contents from. So I'm going to show you a way to actually get the raw flash contents out of one of those capsules. So again, I'm recording the screen, and you know what? I have no shame in it. So you can download a tool 
um, called UEFI Tool. And uh, this is available for um, Linux and Windows and probably macOS as well. Um, and it allows you to uh, inspect the contents of a BIOS ROM to some extent. Um, it's not as fully featured as you might believe, um, but it is the best tool that there really is uh, at the moment. So uh, the way you can get a, the way you can basically de-encapsulate and basically strip off all of the headers um, is to basically just download this um, and basically just, just you know, open up uh, the, the image file that you got from uh, the, your, your BIOS vendor. So in this case, um, it's this PB8X ASUS 6702 is the last version before the Spectre Meltdown patches. It doesn't really matter. Um, you could go back to the first BIOS version, whatever you want, um, but this is the BIOS version that I know that was on there um, previously. And you see it ends in .cap. Cap is the, um, the American Megatrends um, like capsule format. Um, so you couldn't actually flash this if you tried. Um, so I'm just going to open this, and it actually notices that it's an AMI AppDio capsule, and it sees that there's an image and some stuff in here. Um, so that's that's nice. Um, but what we actually want to do is if we go to Action, there's this capsule menu, and then there's Extract Body. And it then uh, allows you to generate a ROM file um, out of this. Because basically what we're doing is we're taking the capsule and we just want the whole body of what's in the capsule without all the header crap. Uh, and I've already done this and I've generated this this uh, this ROM file and I just put the version of the BIOS in there because it's just an auto-generated file name. So that is what's going to get us um, the ROM file. Now the way that you can tell um, is by actually looking at the size of the file. So you'll notice that the capsule file is bigger than the uh, the ROM we just extracted and if you actually check the exact size in bytes of this capsule uh, or of the, sorry, not the capsule, but the ROM inside the capsule, um, this is the exact number of bytes in the uh, in the spy flash chip. And that is a good indication that this is actually the raw, the raw image. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this over to my Raspberry Pi and I'm going to flash this image uh, onto the uh, spy flash chip. So here I am back at my Raspberry Pi and I've just now switched it from a read command to a write command. I'm just going to write that ROM and it's again going to do the same thing. It's now going to uh, read the old contents. It's going to... F wow. That guy's got a real small dick. Um, anyway, so it's going to read the old contents, figure out what needs to change, and then it's going to erase the pages and then rewrite only the pages that it needs to um, to update it to match. And then it's going to verify by basically doing a read back of the chip to verify that uh, what it what it wrote is actually on the chip. Um, so you don't, you don't need to manually uh, verify uh, the output. So again, this is going to take uh, even longer than reading the chip did in the beginning, so I will bring you back when it is done. Okay, so you can see it's been verified. I've taken the chip out, and I've put the chip in the board, so it's back down in here now. And uh, I'm not even going to bother to put the memory back in it. Let's just fire it up and see if this has made any difference whatsoever. Ooh. So, we have a difference. So we have a beep code. So that's one long, two short. And it's not going to stop, is it? Okay. So let me look up what that means, and uh, I'll get back to you. And uh, this could be a while. So uh, I want to make note that uh, pretty much if you Google boop beep codes, you're probably going to get uh, a bunch of shit that's completely wrong, because most of the beep code lists that are online um, and I've dealt with this for other boards. They're all from like boards from 1992, and it's completely irrelevant for any of the modern BIOSes. Um, so that's going to be, you know, a big problem. And they're all different because the BIOS vendors can, like the motherboard vendors can change uh, the beep codes. Um, so I'm going to have to go specifically to ASUS's documentation to see if I can figure out what that means. I suspect it means no memory, um, but I want to verify that. And also, um, the documentation from AMI, American Megatrends, are the ones who actually, they're the OEM of the BIOS, um, their documentation is garbage. I mean, like, actually a raccoon could generate better documentation out of a trash can than they can. Um, and, like, I'm like seriously, if anyone from AMI ever sees this, like, seriously, your public documentation is trash. Like, please tell me what a freaking beep code means. Um, so anyway, uh, 
let's uh, let's uh, I'm gonna look that up and I'm also going to get my memory and we're gonna we're gonna see if this works but that is very promising we've actually we've changed the behavior of the board by by basically reflashing the exact same bios version that was on there previously so um, the theory around the bios is is very promising so I'm actually excited this might actually fix it so I looked up that uh, beep code online and I'm glad that I did check Asus's website because the internet says that that is not a memory error, but Asus says it is a memory error. So that makes sense. So I've put back in my ECC memory stick, and if all goes well, this should boot up. Let's uh, turn you on. It would help if I turn the power supply on. It is getting late, and my brain is getting tired. Okay, so that made no difference. Um, so it is still giving me a memory error, even though it has memory in it. Okay, um, interesting. Let me think about this. So I, uh, I thought about this for a bit, and one thing I want to try is using a different stick of memory. This is not ECC. This is regular DDR3 memory. And the, the Xeon, the memory controller, of course, is in the CPU. And I know that this Xeon can work with uh, non-ECC memory. And the motherboard does not specify um, non-ECC. Everywhere it says it supports ECC, and the wording is as, if, is as if ECC is a, you know, an extra feature, but it doesn't say anything about it exclusively works with ECC. So I just want to see what happens if I put in regular memory, because um, there, maybe there's a problem with the ECC part. Um, so let's try this. Okay, that was different. Um, if I count it right, that was four short beeps, and it's also not doing it again. Let me, let me reset the board. There's a reset jumper here. Yeah, so that's four short beeps. So that's different. Um, and again, I'm going to have to figure out what that means, if anything. Okay, so quite a bit of troubleshooting later, and I think I figured out what's going on. Um, so this, this board only supports ECC, as far as I can tell. And the memory that I was using, which is this memory here, this is some Hynix, um, like SK Hynix ECC. Um, this memory is like your standard ECC memory, um, and it's registered because like most server ECC memory is registered, um, which takes some load off the memory controller. Now this board is weird, and it does not use registered memory. It only uses unregistered ECC memory. Um, and it, it basically, as far as I can tell, it does not work with um, the uh, like regular, uh, just regular DDR3. And the four beeps, so the best that I can come up with is that that means uh, either uh, like system timer failure um, or low memory corruption problem. Um, now system timer refers to the good old, um, you know, Intel uh, 8524, I probably got that number wrong. It's the original, like, uh, programmable timer, programmable interval timer, right? The pit timer that was in the original IBM PC. Um, obviously, that chip doesn't exist anymore, but the logic of it's built into the PCH. Um, and the, the timer, I think it had, like, three, uh, if I remember correctly, this is a long time ago, I think there were three timers. One of them was used as the, um, like, the interrupt zero. One of them was used to refresh the DRAM, um, that, that's not used anymore because DRAM has internal self-refresh. And then the other one was for the PC speaker. Um, so uh, saying that the timer was dead doesn't make a lot of sense because that would mean that there'd be like an internal issue with the PCH, which doesn't make sense. Um, we know that timer 2 is working because the beeper is working and the beeper runs off the timer, so that doesn't make sense. So the, the other thing, that, the thing that, that I'm, I'm thinking is without ECC, when it tries to initialize the lower 64K of RAM, it puts some mem it puts some data there, and the data is corrupted because it's missing the ECC bits, and so it just it you know it, it dies out at that point because it's like well your memory is corrupted, um, like it, it detects that there's memory but tries to put stuff in there and it's corrupted, um, and so that's I think why we get the four beeps with regular ECC, and the reason why I don't think it works why it doesn't detect any memory with this registered memory is because it's registered it's probably not, like, it, it, because it has to go through that latch to get the data out. I think that it's just, it, because it, it doesn't know that's there, it's not 
set up to, to, to use it. It just doesn't see this at all. Um, so I found, I only have like a couple sticks, this, this weird low profile memory. I had to really dig for this, but I think this is unregistered memory. Um, so let's see what this does because now that I've actually read the manual, I know what memory this thing's supposed to take. So let's see what happens now. Okay, so it just turned off. It's going to turn on. Oh. This is promising. So we're using 48 watts. It's a different wattage than before. Oh, yes. That would be the beep. That would be the beep of life right there. Uh, I'm going to hook up a monitor to this and see if we have output, but I think we do. So I've got my little monitor hooked up, and look at what we got here. American Megatrends. This is our P8BX. There's our Xeon, and it's got our shitty little 2 gig stick of memory. And, you know, it says uh, press F1 to continue with no keyboard detected. Um, so uh, I didn't have a keyboard plugged in and it's USB, so I think I'm going to have to turn it off in order to get the this to work. Oh no, my light is falling over. Let's see, where is my keyboard? I don't think this is going to work because it's USB. It's probably going to need to reset for this to work. Oh, no, actually, no, it worked. Press F1 to run setup. There we go. So there is our working system. So I very much suspect that it's going to boot into an OS and be okay. So, um, yeah, so I think this is fixed. Uh, I think this board, I think I can scrub over the, the dead sticker on there, and uh, it's good. So the, the, the cause of death, uh, as far as I can tell, was corruption in the BIOS code itself. Um, so exactly how that got corrupted, uh, I don't know. Uh, and obviously, I'm going to boot up an OS and do some stress tests and just verify that everything is still okay. Um, it could be that the you know there's there was something physically wrong with the the flash chip itself, um, and you know the, the bits got corrupted, um, you know just bit rot, some kind of thing like that. So the memory card in my camera overheated, um, but I think I was basically saying. Um, I think that this failed either due to a, some sort of bit rot or some erroneous um, write to that uh, spy device uh, corrupted something. Um, whatever it happens to be, it was probably a transient event. Um, it doesn't seem to have a problem now. Um, of course, testing will, will prove that. Uh, but I think I'm going to be figuring out what I'm going to do with this. I might end up replacing one of my servers with it. Again, the memory is going to be a bit of an issue because I don't have much of it. Uh, but this is a nice CPU. It's faster than a lot of the other stuff that I have. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's how you go about diagnosing and fixing a board. Obviously, if you have a dead board, it's probably not going to be this problem, um, but maybe it is, and maybe this process is something that you can take to try and diagnose uh, the problem you have. So uh, before the memory card uh, overheats again, I uh, think I will say goodbye and uh, hope to see you uh, in my next repair adventure. So uh, as always, thanks for watching.